between Munich and Frankfurt. We used to ask for a franchise. Can we please have a division? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I, that's not that, that's part of what we're doing, right? We're trying to sort of see could you could you have multiple locations in Europe where you could have a you know an NFL franchise because it would be easier as a division. Mm. An entire division. I got to go to London. Who's going to own those teams because they're allegedly starting a division in Europe? I don't think players are going to want to play in London. Last night, The Athletic reported the Chargers could relocate to London. They love the sport, they love getting the games here, and they ask us, when are we going to get a team here for good? Obviously, we flew overnight and just got here, but we're ready to roll. The NFL in Europe. Three to four times a year for the past eight years or so, the NFL's been having a little pop-up shop out here. And there's no doubt they've been a hit. You can't have 90,000 fans selling out Wembley and not be a hit. It's undeniable. And that's why the idea of a permanent team out here has been floated around for years. But quadrupling down and going for an entire European division, that's game changing. How would that even work? How do you do travel? How do you do free agency, practice squads? Most NFL players have never even been to the UK. And isn't soccer king here? Don't Europeans laugh at us and call our game hand egg? Hence, football. You see? Are you following this, America? <sighs> Maybe they do. Whatever. Football is working here, specifically London. This video isn't just about NFL expansion because I can make that video really quickly. Yes, they want to expand because expanding means more money. This video is about what it looks like. The NFL's long run, complex, nuanced European plan that's been in motion for 50 years now. But first, let me show you what American football looks like in London. I'm gonna give you the complete story behind all of it. But first, I'm gonna slip into this place over here, have a pre-game meal, a little fish and chips because it almost feels illegal not to. Now, right away, the best comp for these games is the NFL Pro Bowl, if it actually mattered. The weekend is equal parts meaningful regular season game and broader celebration of football. I'm pretty sure I saw a jersey from every franchise, but perhaps the most shocking difference is the way Londoners treat the pregame vibe. We Americans would never build a stadium without parking lots. Just wouldn't happen. The 49ers went as far as to build their stadium 43 miles outside of the city just for the lot access. At Wembley and many other European venues, there are no lots. Instead of parking, a sea of fans spill off the platform of the tube and march their way to the pubs. The closest thing to a tailgate might be a group of Bengals fans hanging out by a street sign or Broncos fans sucking down a cold one underneath the cover of a bus stop. Still, the pubs deliver every bit of the pregame party. They start buzzing around 9 a.m. and the juice is flowing, but the football atmosphere isn't quite there. Most conversations aren't loaded with pregame anxiety and the TV show Premier League highlights from the day before. Now, throwing down a bet is also a far cry from the States. There's a physical store you enter to put money down. This one was completely empty and the process was clumsy. Actually, being inside Wembley didn't disappoint though. Every fan was in their seat and genuinely hyped for kickoff. Big plays from either side were met with a roar from the 90,000 fans. The second half was a change of pace though. Three whole sections just didn't return to their seats until the middle of the third. A bit surprising because concession culture is not known to dominate Premier League matches. These Brits hammering home claw dogs instead of locking in for the second half was the most American thing I saw all day. Overall, these differences I mentioned are noticeable, but it still feels like our game. It doesn't feel like a strange variation like Arena League football or Canadian League football. This is America, baby! This is America's game on European soil. And it's ours. It's not even in the Olympics. And did we screw up by calling it football? Yeah, we probably shouldn't have done that. 
Maybe it's a mistake. Jokes aside though, why did I hop on a plane and fly to Europe to make a video about NFL expansion? There's a million sports topics to choose from, but this feels different. I don't believe it's hyperbole to say this feels like the boldest sports experiment in my lifetime. The NFL is vital to American culture. It's practiced like religion. It owns a day of the week like religions. This is the top 20 most watched telecast of 2021. Not only sporting events, anything on primetime. The NFL is a global revenue super factory. Their revenue was 19 billion in 2021, and their goal is 25 billion by 2027. The entire country of Iceland's GDP is 27 billion. It's no secret or genius observation that money drives this whole initiative. You go to the sport, you make more money. Simple as that. But just getting to this point has been a masterful display of perseverance and long run strategy from the NFL. It's super important you understand that planning, so let me do what I do best and give you 100 years of history in less than one minute. Greetings, fellow football fanatics. Back in 1910, a crew of US soldiers stationed in London played the very first game of football on European soil. By the start of World War II, these type of one-off games were kind of buzzing. The US even challenged Canada to a game that was eventually played in front of 30,000 fans in London. Pretty soon, a league with a terribly long name was founded. Essentially, if you had a team and you were near an Air Force base, you played. The league's 1951 championship was important enough to become the first ever game at Wembley, but American football stayed quiet for the next 30 years before erupting in the 80s. The NFL started to take globalizing the game seriously and made the call to broadcast games and play preseason games all over Europe. The 86 Super Bowl was really the turning point. The UK broadcast hauled in 4 million viewers despite the game kicking off around midnight. All of this was great, but the European leagues were a mess. In 89, the British American Football League was born, which featured a whopping 95 UK-based teams across three divisions. Then in 91, the NFL pushed all their chips to the middle and attempted the most ambitious league the world had ever seen, the World League of American Football. The league kicked off with three Euro teams, six American teams, and one Canadian team. So that is the whole timeline. And we know the actual physical game that we've built and put on the field is great. We love that. But what keeps people coming back is the beautiful culture, the amazing things we've built around this game. Things like tailgates, watch parties, TV channels, betting, fantasy, definitely fantasy. There's over 60 million people in the US who don't just watch football, but take it to the next level and play fantasy. TJ Hoshmazod, yes, lock it up. Who? What? You mean TJ Hushmanzada from the Bengals? Put him on the board. Hausha Mazzoli. Got it. Championship. This whole process and culture we've built just feels like part of my life or part of the American sports fan's life. And as I mentioned, our game is doing well over here, but let me add some perspective. It's impossible to know just exactly how much more popular soccer here is than football, but we can use Google Trends to get us pretty close. The numbers tell us that soccer is 25 times more popular here than football. And to give you a better idea of just how dominant 25 times is, American football is only seven times more popular than hockey in the United States. Of course, putting a franchise here or four is no small logistical feat. It's probably the first thing that anybody would bring up when talking to you about the difficulties of this project, but the truth is it's not the biggest issue. The NFL and their expert staff have become masters at making these games happen here over the last 20 years. And might the players not love playing in England right away? Sure, that's entirely possible, but there's a long list of things players don't like. Maybe getting drafted number one overall to the worst team. They put up with it. By far, the biggest problem is the level of competition. And you'll hear Roger Goodell say this over and over and over again, not logistics, competition, just like this clip I'm about to show you. This is from the same interviews before, but nobody clipped it. It made it look all good on social media. Please welcome the commissioner of the NFL, Mr. Roger Goodell. Um, the, the question I think is gonna come down, and it's not so much the logistics about travel, that's clearly a challenge and we'd have to schedule that. It really comes down to can you do it competitively where the team here or the teams in the states that are coming over here can continue to be competitive and that was a challenge when we did the regular season games there was a lot of reluctance on our ownership when we first introduced this the divisions would most likely become six divisions of six and i know that sounds weird right now because there's 32 teams and it's a perfect square number and the schedule's easy this stuff can be manipulated. You can make two games traveling abroad so you don't have to go overseas twice. But like Roger said, 
the issue here is competition. Will these teams be afforded the resources to compete? The biggest fact is this is sports and winning matters and Roger Goodell and the NFL know this and they can't trot teams out here that are looking like the Scottish Claymores in Madden 2004 with a 47 overall. And by the way, if you're unfamiliar with the Claymores, I need to explain because it's the closest thing the NFL has done to what they're doing right now and it failed miserably. Remember that really ambitious league I mentioned earlier, the World League of Football? NFL execs built it with one theory and one goal in mind. People love football, so why can't we make more money on an additional season during spring? It made sense, but severely lacked execution. Everything about this venture was disorganized. The Barcelona Dragons were three months out from their inaugural kickoff on national TV with zero coaches, staff, or players. All they had was Andrew Brandt, an NFL agent turned GM. And the only reason he had the job was because when they asked him if he spoke Barcelonan, he replied, I speak Spanish. And that was perfect. Turns out the whole traveling across the Atlantic Ocean for road games didn't work. After only two seasons of that, the NFL was bleeding cash and they failed, but not permanently. They took a three-year break and returned with the six-team Europe-only league. This didn't work either. The league was losing about $30 million a year, but had a genius idea in 98. Rebrand it as NFL Europe and put more teams in Germany. This was when kids like myself were introduced to the comically low value teams in the Madden video game. Now, German fans actually responded well, but the league was on life support at this point. Thankfully, the NFL had an even more brilliant plan. In 06, they rebranded NFL Europe to NFL Europa. It's brilliant, Harry. Brilliant. <laughs> of course, this had very little, if any, impact at all. Roger Goodell took over as commissioner a year later, and one of the first matters he presided over was the fate of NFL Europa. He studied the over $400 million lost over 16 years and sadly concluded there were no names left they could rebrand to. He had no choice but to lay the league to rest. Jokes aside though, Roger was thrilled to make this call. It meant he could begin the International Series, which I referred to as the NFL's version of a pop-up shop earlier. So the question is, will this work this time around? Has the NFL learned from their failed experiments or are they just being stubborn and kind of greedy? It's like greedy. Okay, they're at least kind of greedy, but stubborn is probably the wrong word here. I think a word like courageous or ambitious better suits a timeline. And look, it could be really good for American NFL fans. European fans passionately support their clubs and their games are outrageous and they're out of control and their NFL games will probably be like that too. Maybe we can steal from it a little bit. At the end of the day, this is a bold, bold move from the biggest sports league in the entire world. They are openly telling us the next iteration of their business and they don't just believe these European cities are aligned. They believe they're eager to pounce on this opportunity. I'm sure there's still loads of NFL owners who are not ready for this. They are not for this, but it's not going to matter. Roger Goodell is for this and he is going to make this his legacy. It is coming whether they like it or not and they're all going to be happy once they get a big fat expansion check in their pocket. But Roger's right on this. This is business and business is evolve or die. And as a creator, as an entrepreneur, as an NFL fan, that's something to be excited about.